series of projects or a set of projects I've been doing around the book The Dispossessed, Ursula K. Le Guin's book The Dispossessed, and just a few months ago I finished this book called Marking the Dispossessed, which is um, sort of based on all these copies of The Dispossessed that I have. So I thought what I will do is actually I'll read from the, uh, the text that I wrote uh, as part of this book, um, and I have some slides. Um, so Marking the Dispossessed compiles hundreds of isolated reader's marks found in a collection of used copies of Ursula K. Le Guin's 1974 anarchist science fiction novel, The Dispossessed. Sometimes subtitled An Ambiguous Utopia, The Dispossessed is the story of a physicist, Shevek, who travels from his planet of anarchists, Anaris, to a sister planet, Eurus. One of those planets is pictured here, I'm not sure which one. This is a <laughs> close-up of one of the covers. Um, Ursula, uh, Le Guin describes Shevek's confrontation with things he hasn't experienced before, like class difference, gender hierarchy, and personal property, as well as his perplexed encounters with everyday signs of excess, like the complicated layers of packaging around a box of chocolates. The book is organized with chapters that alternate between Shevek's life on Anaris and Eurus. The project of compiling reader's marks began after I first read The Dispossessed about six years ago. I was so moved by its contents that, and uh, by the possibility of a different social order that I didn't want to leave it. Um, and this is something that often happens with good books. For, for me, I'll get completely sucked in while reading, but then as soon as I'm done, I forget why why I liked it so much. I just remembered that I liked it. Um, so this project is in a way an exercise in trying to spend more time with the dispossessed. I started buying used copies here and there uh, when I encountered them. And I thought there was something tautologically satisfying about collecting dispossessed copies of the dispossessed. Um, I also liked to see the different covers and the signs of previous ownership the occasional dog-eared pages, receipts, or books, uh, bookmarks left inside the pages. I began ordering them online, and it was almost too easy to get them. Uh, they're cheap. In less than one hour of searching online, I could find five or eight used copies, and they'd be shipped to me from around the country. Um, I imagined these copies of the dispossessed languishing in warehouses with no windows, with barcodes on their spines to make them easier and faster to track and find. They ended up in these warehouses, I imagined, after having been a part of personal collections where they might have been sitting in someone's basement. Several of the copies uh, were disacquisitioned from libraries. For example, the Tottenham Branch Library, which actually on the inside is stamped the new Tecumseh Public Library in Ontario. And the Ruiz branch of the Austin Public Library in Texas. I had an idea of bringing them together like far-flung brethren or maybe a sisterhood of books that had been dispersed through the world, that had been read or in a way consumed and then discarded. But then I doubted my own impulse to collect, especially a book of anarchist fiction Many passages in The Dispossessed describe possessions as excrement. On Anaris, the accumulation of stuff is a sign of poor health, of badness and grossness. On page 138, uh, Le Guin writes, they think if people can possess enough things, they will be content to live in prison. And here I found myself confusingly collecting old copies of this book, which I liked so much, but the more copies I had, the more it turned into stuff. Stuff to be moved around my office, stuff to be packed into boxes or carried here and there. I labeled the books, I organized them, I looked for patterns. I tried to make sense of the various print runs and covers, but now they've become my, responsibili my responsibility and I have all these copies, so many copies. I go back and forth between feeling like I need to keep them together and feeling like I should distribute them or give them away, but then there'll be no more collection. I looked more carefully at the books with marks, the ones whose readers had taken notes in them, underlined passages or otherwise left traces of their reading. Um, I don't often write in books, especially uh, novels, but The Dispossessed was one that 
caused me to locate a pen so as to draw a few lines in the margin to call attention to certain passages that I didn't want to forget. Um, I wanted to take those passages with me. I wanted to own them and to remember them. So in this, in this, uh, on this page, I, I underlined, this is actually my copy, I think. Um, there was process. Process was all. And then, of course, I didn't necessarily remember those passages forever. And also, they're not all relevant the way they were at the moment I read them. But still, marking helps to remember to ingrain. I would read a passage, like it, reach for a pen, go back to reread and identify which part I really wanted to remember and mark it. Those steps make the book last longer. They make it possible to sit for a little bit with the words. Um, this has a very small line. No distinction, this is a quote from this uh, page 156 at the bottom. No distinction was drawn between art and the crafts. Art was not considered as having a place in life, but as being a base technique of life, like speech. So marking the dispossessed, in a way, is made up of marks of possession. It exists around this vexed issue of ownership and past ownership, of use value and uselessness. The more a book is marked, the more value it might have had for the original reader, but the less value it has on the market as a used book, unless the marks are made by a famous person. Of the 100 used copies I examined, a little over half of them were marked in some way, maybe just by a person's handwritten name inside the front cover, uh, or stamps from the library, or from a library. Of those, um, out of those copies, about half again, roughly 25 books, had handwritten marks left by readers inside the actual text. At first, I looked through these to see if there was overlap between these and the marks in my own books, and I realized quickly that there wasn't much. Uh, people mark things for different, reason, different reasons. One was obviously a student in a class who had been assigned this text and read it attentively in an academic way. Uh, these are vocabulary words, I think, on the left. Uh, making copious notes and marks and then abruptly stopping about a, th a third of the way into the book. Another, oh, and then I started the number 87, like up in there, I started, I started like using this system for uh, tracking and numbering the books while I was working to keep track of them. Um, another person, the owner of book 54, underlined something on almost every single page in the book. At times, this reader underlined every line in a paragraph individually in light pencil. They didn't use the tactic of placing a vertical bar in the margin, as so many other readers did, or of bracketing off relevant sections, but they preferred to underline. They used a sharp pencil, maybe a mechanical pencil, from start to finish. Another reader, the owner of book 18, seemed to be writing back to the book, not to Ursula Le Guin, but to Shevek, the protagonist. So here they wrote, no. No, 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 about uh, mutual aid, I guess. Um, and then on another page, they wrote, who is sophomoric enough to think life could or should be painless? And they also wrote, I'm going to vomit. And also, it sounds like me and my friends. <laughs> so, um, and then other, other readers would make the book easier to reference later. Um, or it seemed they would, they, would, they, would, they would reference what's happening on a page time, blindness, or uh, marriage, music. Several books have just a few words in the entire book underlined, like this one. It has the sentence, perhaps it won't always be so underlined. And that's the only underline in the entire book. So in this book, Marking the Dispossessed, I collected all the visible marks that I could and layered them page by page. I didn't pull underlines or marks from copies of the book that predate the 1991 edition, as those have a different page layout, and the text does not line up as it does in later editions. But I removed the original text, and then in collapsing the marks from each page, it's no longer possible to distinguish between individual readers. The marks are made by a group of people who have read The Dispossessed, or libraries that have owned The Dispossessed. Um, I wanted to see if patterns might emerge, and they don't, really. 
Um, but we can see that some passages get a lot of attention and others don't. But just as often, a lone reader would find something interesting to mark and nobody else joined them. So The Dispossessed came out in 1974 when the Cold War was still in full effect and the urban uprisings of the late 1960s were a recent memory. But for readers over the last 30 years, different political events would resonate. Um, I think on this page you can see there's notes in the margin uh, refer to the US and the Soviet Union. Um, someone else notes uh, references Kent State and the Detroit riots. When I sought out other readers of The Dispossessed, I found many who had read it, but they were not in the same space with it as I was. Either they had just finished reading and were still in its immediate afterglow, or um, it was a distant memory to them. Reading is so intimate, it's just between the reader and the author, and it's hard to share a reading experience since it really happens inside your head, unless you happen to be reading out loud, which we will be later. Um, we each have our own intense experiences, but they're out of sync with others. Something about this particular book made me want to find a collective experience. So alongside this book of Marx, I've also been organizing these group readings. Um, and originally, like what we'll be doing um, a little later, and originally uh, my idea was to put these together as a kind of a used audiobook version of The Dispossessed. So, um, where people would people read underlined passages and they read the comments out loud. Um, and when several books have the same passages marked, the voices read in unison. But you can't actually make a used audiobook because it's against uh, copyright law uh, <laughs> to do that, I learned. Uh, probably not surprisingly. But, um, but I still like, want to continue doing these readings because um, the, the, for those of you who can stay later, it's sort of a nice, it's a nice experience, and so it's still nice to do. Um, so this was a reading of chapter two at uh, Labyrinth Books in Princeton, New Jersey. Um, and then this was, a, this was actually at the New York Art Book Fair a couple of weeks ago, and I'll just play, if this works, this is a like advanced use of technology, but I'm gonna just play <laughs> um, a recording, and the recording is actually not from this particular reading, but the, in the picture, but you can hear a little bit. Then, as Shabak sat marveling, marveling, as the car came up out of the flock of the river valley into clearer air, there looked at him from the darkness under the roadside foliage for one instance of face. All lives are in common. It was not like any human face, it was as long as the sun on the gas was in light, black jagged and vapor from what must be nostrils, and terrible, unmistakable, the wizard's eye. A large, sharp eye, mournful, perhaps cynical, gone in the flash of our eyes. Okay, I'll just stop it there. It sounds a little bit crazy, but, or not, it doesn't sound crazy, but it's a nice, uh, it's a, yeah, that was just from the first uh, chapter, and not all the readers have read The Dispossessed, and not of all of them are necessarily comfortable reading, but it's kind of a, there's a, I think there's an interesting effect. It's almost like the, the doubling or tripling of voices acts almost like visible underlines, but you can hear them. Um, and then as a relation, and sort of related to this project, I, uh, this is a reading in um, Toronto at Art Metropole. Um, and then this was a reading at the Detroit Art Book Fair just a couple, or last weekend. Um, and then, so then when someone has a comment in the margins, they just raise their hand and then um, we, they read that comment. Um, but related to this project and to the Marking the Dispossessed project, they've also been working um, with this percussion group, Mobius Percussion, to make like a audio book version of this underlines. Um, and I worked with a uh, uh, um, friend of mine who's a composer and percussionist named Jason Truding from So Percussion. So this was also, we, we've been sort of developing this um, percussion version, which, which I'll just play like a, a short clip. Um, it's very, uh, it's non-melodic, I can just say, but...
so it's it's you it, you can just get a general idea but basically they're playing the um there's mostly actually yeah so basically basically they so we, they figured out a system for how to kind of make the underlines uh, 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 sound like something. Um, <laughs> and a lot of that was actually, they were playing the part in between something happening. So I just, I, I just accidentally played a not very exciting part, but, um, but okay. In The Dispossessed, Le Guin enacts a version of anarchism that's closely rela related to that of political theorist Peter Kropotkin's, where people take what they need and are motivated by cooperation rather than competition. Le Guin's anarchist utopia may be an ambiguous one, the story takes place in a society that has already been established for several generations and is a bit frayed. It's nonetheless compelling, especially now in 2015, as cycles of political upheaval intensify around the world and so many of us long for viable alternatives to the persistent inequality that results from unbridled capitalism. The most heavily marked passage in the collection of books comes late in the novel. It's on page 295, um, as you can see here, and it's spoken by a Eurasti political activist who explains to Shevek why his very existence is threatening to the political establishment on Eurus. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, uh, so the quote, yeah, so he says, you are an idea, a dangerous one, the idea of anarchism made flesh walking amongst us. I read The Dispossessed almost as a self-help book. Let's start an anarchist society. I don't know if that's me. Oh. Okay, I don't know what that is. Okay, let's start an anarchist society. So, um, Anaris, the planet, is a place with the potential for pure togetherness. Does a collection of used books create a kind of togetherness? What kind of intimacy emerges from a group of readers reading out loud together, or from a set of readers' marks on the same pages? A secondary text comes out of the collection of handwritten notes in margins, like an echo of the book. I realized that my own reading experience was rather naive. It was maybe too open, too uncritical, and ready to receive. But there's something to knowing that my reading was one among many. I hoped to get a sense of a kind of mass readership, to imagine so many individual readers absorbing this text independently, but also together at different times and in different places. Um, so, I don't know what that, so I was gonna, I was gonna, um, uh, I wanted to just read an excerpt um, from the index of this book, and the index is a collection of all the readers' uh, comments. They're organized, um, uh, like, like anytime somebody put a comment on page 161, I put them all together. Um, so, so, so I was just gonna read, it's about like, I think it's like eight minutes, um, just this, uh, just these notes, and I'm not sure if the sound is coming from here, but hopefully yeah, yeah. it's okay. Um, okay, so, um, and I just put this together on the plane, so hopefully it's gonna work. Uh, these, are the, these are the notes themselves. Um, okay, I know how you feel. Ornament excremental, badap, no property. Not acknowledged, starhawk. Amen, the wall. Control of ideas, power. That's what I said. Anarchist critique. Barrenness, solidarity. Franklin. Education. Reprimand. They. Sex with Badap. Music. Simultaneity principle. Yoga. Bhagavad Gita. PACI library. Yeah, I identify. Ack, would you listen to this crap? <laughs> Occupations of uninhabited space. Exuberant life. Love of nature, takver. Not excrement. Um, no animals. FRJ. Wall. With the kids. Named by computer. Yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> Sameness of your rasty faces. Art. Body profiteer. Sex possession. Not a salesman. Confused by money. Consumption. Veya. Masking with shyness her situation of being bought. Astute comp, oh sorry. Queen Taya. 
Hiding, debate with Thea. Civilization. Faulkner's Benji. Time. Shit rolls downhill. Probability theory, quantum mechanics. Sexism. Being. Anaris Eurus. This is cool. Chaos theory, reconciling free will and determinism. Cause, effect, etc. Chaos theory. Exactly. You blow hard. <laughs> um, this, I couldn't read the first word, but the second word is Anaris. Um, Anaris, nothing beautiful but faces. Possessing nothing, they are free. Self satire? Possession. Oh, sorry, this was a repeat. Oh, sorry, I have a. I, this is an accident of doing this on the plane. Okay. Wall. Sexual assault. Rabble in apocalyptic mood. 178, time passes. Men? Security is freedom. That's what happens over time in a relationship that kills it. Possession is asserted and giving stops. Hunger, power, all behind his back. Other sacrificing self for sake of other. Shame, hangover, Vietnam, obviously. Ansible, this is a bit unsettling. Hyperspace, um, it's like a self. Question mark? <laughs> revelation of the theory. Physics, spiritual revelations are one. A leap onto a higher plane of something, the darkest, the hardest place, the wall, is precisely the place where a passage opens. Like Odo, no owners. Shevek's info. People. I'm going to vomit, scared to death. Promise of Anaris, Shevek's danger, idea made flesh, anarchism made flesh. Sounds like me and my friends. Print, song. He came to fight power on Eurus, sensing the germination of a corruption on Anaris. His speech, Shevek's speech. Africa clan, Kent State, Beijing, Detroit riots. Down, army organization, partnering, description of the town, family ties. That's nice. Jewelry. Tyrion versus Shevek. Tyrion versus Shevek, not able to share. Bureaucracy, Foucauldian. Social conscience dominates. Science, art. Odo, means equals ends. Unbuild walls, publication, unbuild walls. No end, only process. Suffering, joy. Good move. He too falls into sexist trap. Tau Kada, or I'm not sure what this is. Um, solidarity, the gift, language and possession. Damn, Eurus is a box. Strange, debate, deserve earning. But A doesn't want that science. Autonomy, revolution, shudder, xenophobia, exiles in exile, return. Pick up Jess, nine o'clock. Um, and then this is on the back cover. Sharon Kratz, I'll just read part of this. Sharon Kratz, Sky Blazer, number 16, care of General Delivery, Spanish Fork, Utah, 84660. Attention, Sharon Kratz. We'll call July 28th, August 4th. Dialogue is so important in the context of personal origin because it allows people to be their own psychiatrist, to come to see their own problems and pathways to solution. Literature, a text, open to dialogic interpretation, 
takes on a role of a counterpart, addressable other. That's what I want my poems to be, companions, counterparts, addressable entities that also speak back to you. It pushes us beyond limits of mere common sense, but striving toward the meaning, limitations, we make meaning out of chaos, life out of nothing. And that's, that's the end. That was the, la that was a, um, that was the last comment. So I think, um, yeah, so I think, uh, what I thought maybe we can, uh, we can, I think we have a few minutes, or no, I don't know if we have a few minutes. It's, uh, we, can, we can, if you have, if you guys have any like um, questions or anything to talk about, we can talk a little bit and then take a break. And then we'll like, um, if any, and if anybody would like to read, um, we have lots of, I have lots of copies of the book <laughs> and lots of opportunities for reading. I'm going to stand there with a copy so you can just like basically come to me and I'll give you one. Yeah. And give you a few tips. And we'll be here, I'll be here tomorrow too, also <laughs> reading That's all day tomorrow, but. Um, all yeah, from two, two from two. Two, 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 five, and then again from six to eight. Two, two. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and it's also possible to just drop in and then read for 30 minutes or so or an hour. <laughs> I'm hoping to get through the whole book. So we're up to chapter four, like halfway through chapter four now. And there's 13 chapters, I think. So I took a break after I found out it was, after, I was sort of discouraged when they told me I couldn't do the used audio book. But now we're moving forward just with the readings. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, so this one, um, the ones that I was showing now, I had separated them out. So this is, yeah, this is one person's note in the back of the book. It's the back, it's the very back cover, actually. So like, but it's on the same as the, um, the Sharon Kratz, you know, it's just the, it's just in the back cover. Yeah, so the way, like in this book, the way I organized it, it's like the same page. So like page 182, 183, it's like all the notes of, anybody who put a note on that page. And then what I was showing just now was like individual um, notes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. there's really like not that much, there's some overlap, but it's like not as much as you would, I guess, think. But maybe because it's a novel, I thought if it was a like political theory or a more difficult text, more people would mark the same passages. So chapter four, halfway through chapter four. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, I'll give you like, I was thinking it'll be like when people read from their book, I'll give you, I can just explain like the context, yeah. <laughs> but also, yeah, and also if anyone is interested in the book, I have a lot of copies of it that most of the copies don't have notes. So I marked the copies that don't have notes. If, if anyone would like a copy of The Dispossessed, I would be happy to share that with you. <laughs> um, um, should you, do you already talk about the book, or why you, why is it the dispossessed, or um, what's, did you talk about the story? Um, a yeah, a little bit, just the story of, um, but yeah, it's just the story of this physicist who comes from a planet that's been settled by anarchists, and then he travels to a planet called Eurus that's similar to Earth, um, and it's like, a, it's like a, so he's sort of so it's a, so it's an anarchist fam planet that's actually like 200 years old. So they have kind of already um, it's sort of fraying a little bit. Um, and then he comes to Eurus, and um, which and nobody's ever traveled between the planets really. Like they've kind of have a they sort of have a closed uh, door. That's why there's all the wall. Everyone's noting the wall because there's sort of like this barrier between the two planets. And it turns out you find out later that the way that anarchist even sort of exists is that it's kind of a mining colony of an era, of a Eurus. And so they provide uh, like they provide uh, like ore or sort of like basic materials to Eurus. And then in exchange, Eurus doesn't like take over or attack them because they're anarchists. So they're based and they're basically, you know, everything is by, you know, you sort of it sort of it sort of it sort of makes you think about how it's actually they're like very vulnerable because they're not they're organized, but they're not really um, Everybody does whatever they want, basically. But it's, yeah, it's a really interesting book. Um, 
but maybe also the process of like this profession that just that you sort of repeat in the making of the process. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's also, yeah, it was, yeah, I mean, the part of it was, like, also just this, like, pun or something that you're, like, I mean, not a pun, really, but you're, like, it's dispossessed. It's, like, I would find these copies in used bookstores and be, like, oh, like, it's such a good book. Like, it shouldn't be sitting here on the shelf by itself, you know? And then, also, like, I'm a book designer um, in, in, in more in general, or I, de I make books, and I was also just thinking about how, you know, you design the books, and then you've got, like, let's say, 500 copies of this book, and then they just get dispersed. And then I thought, like, maybe it's kind of nice to bring them back together. I mean, they've never been together, you know, so it's kind of like, I mean, it's part of it is just like anthropomorphizing these particular books, but I feel like it's like you're kind of bringing them back together and you're like, okay, you can, you know, <laughs> and it's, you know, but they're from different times. And, and, then, and then I think it's also this thing about the readers, like, like part of it was like, you know, if you read Harry Potter, like I'm also, you know, have read Harry Potter a number of times. And if I'm into Harry Potter, there's so many ways I can like extend the experience of having read Harry Potter. Like there's like the, Potter World game online or whatever. There's like too many things, but this book came out in '74, so uh, you know uh, you're you're kind of really into it. But it's not like a, it's not like so fresh that everyone is really like thinking about it right now. Um, so it's also sort of a way to try to like I was thinking about trying to like co collect readers from like across time, um, in a way. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like, see, I think when I've talked to other people, I think people read it usually when they're younger than I was, like, because I was, like, 35 or something, you know, and, like, um, I feel like it's the kind of book you read in your 20s, and, in fact, my brother gave it to me when I was, like, 18, but I never read it um, then, you know, <laughs> and I'm, like, and then I feel like, but I felt like an 18-year-old that kind of, because she kind of, it's, it's, it's like I realized later I looked at this Kropotkin, like this, which was like more like anarchist sort of theorist, and I realized a lot of what she's writing about is sort of borrowing from that political theory. Um, but what's so, I think what's so exciting about it is she just imagines this whole society, like, like how it could work, you know, and describes like from, from just social interactions to like, you know, actually the production of like arts and also just like material goods. Oh. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, so anyway, I think it's just like, um, I just, uh, I think it presents, it makes it seem possible. Suddenly you feel like you can imagine it. And then I think I read it and I thought like, if enough people have also read this book, maybe you can, I don't know, maybe you, I, 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 if you just, you know, it's like when you watch The Wizard of Oz or something, and you're like, I want to be there, and like, it doesn't really exist, but <laughs> it feels like similar a little bit, um, and uh, yeah, and I think now also I feel so jaded, or you feel so like, there's no alternatives, it feels, I mean, he, to me here, you know, Canada feels like an alternative to the States, and, but it's still like, I mean, in the sense that you can see like how things could be a little bit more um, equitable than they are like where in Detroit where I'm coming from where there's like extreme inequality but still like you don't have this like total you don't have any model really right now where you can see like something that's totally different like a totally different way to organize society so I think that's why uh, I don't know that's why it's sort of exciting and I and I think but I think yeah when I've talked to p other people it seems like it's a book you people a lot of people read in like their 20s and a lot of people like read it for school too. And I was also thinking about that too. Like when you look through the notes, that you can so almost sense there's a kind of passivity by people from people who maybe read it for a class. You know, I was like, I was like, maybe it shouldn't be assigned for class. <laughs> maybe maybe it's better to just like read it. But can you tell us a bit more about yourself? Oh yeah. Like so, uh, are you? Is this just sort of a project you've undertaken, or are you? I mean, I suppose I could. <laughs> yeah, I'm a gra well. I, yeah, I'm a I'm a I, like I, I went to school for graphic design and I'm basically a graphic designer and I work with a a, a group of other designers, three of us, and our group is called Clanada. It's me, my friend Lana, and Natasha. So we three of us work together on um, 
some commercial stuff, but we also did a book a few years ago called Thanks for the View, Mr. Mies, which is about a neighborhood called Lafayette Park in Detroit, designed by Mies van der Rohe. Um, so we've done, we've done some books or some kind of projects that are like self, that are like just sort of book projects where we're kind of doing the research. And now we're, work, now we're researching a hotel in Sarajevo, a holiday, it's like the Holiday Inn in Sarajevo in Bosnia. Um, but yeah, and I, and I, but, I, but I teach now, so I got into the academic side, and I actually was on a fellowship the last two years at, at Princeton, and then I had all this time to do this project. It had been like on my mind to do something like with, the, or I had been collecting all these copies of The Dispossessed, so I finally had the time to kind of get it together. Um, and um, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay, okay. So really, I think it's fascinating the way that somebody has like been like, okay, well then we're just going to go deep into that. Like, is that sci-fi? This is sci-fi as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, the other book, uh, the other Ursula K. Le Guin book that a lot of people really like is The Left Hand of Darkness, and that's also, that's amazing too, and that's more, that's a planet of, uh, of uh, like hermaphrodites, or it's like, it's like an androgynous society where, and so she, I mean, no, so she's totally like this feminist, um, you know, anarchist sci-fi author, but it makes, it makes you think like, gosh, we should all be writing sci-fi, I guess. Or like spending more time with, with sci-fi, but she she recently Ursula, Ursula Le Guin just recently got this big national book award that was like it's like a really big deal because it's the first time it's been given to somebody who's like a sci-fi you know person. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, she has also like, like the planets she talks about. There are other books that she's written that sort of deal with the sim some of these planets too. But but this is the only one that's really kind of the anarchist. But she's she's. I've heard her say that there's another book she wrote called Always Coming Home that she considers to be more. Like true anarchist sci-fi, sci um. and that one's perhaps less popular. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, it's actually written in. It's more like I think it's like anarcho-primitivism, or you know, like that style. It's like it sort of takes place in California, like California, like on the west coast of the United States, like in the future after everything's been kind of obliterated, but now it's like a desert and. Um, it's written in a different. It's sort of written in a style that's. Uh, from the future too, so it's a little bit more difficult maybe, but this one is totally, yeah. I think I read it like on the plane, on a long plane trip, you know, like you can read it really fast. Page 103. Sabu was a small, stocky, slovenly man of 40. His facial hair was darker and coarser than common and thickened to a regular beard on his chin. He wore a heavy winter over tunic and from the look of it, had worn it since last winter. The ends of the sleeves were black with grime. His manner was abrupt and grudging. He spoke in scraps, as he scribbled notes on scraps. He growled, you've got to learn iotic. He growled a Chevy. Learn iotic? I said, I learn, learn iotic. What for? So you, so you can read your ass to physics. Atro, to, bias, those men. men. Nobody's translated it into product. product. Nobody's, Nobody's likely, likely to. to. Six, Six people, people maybe, maybe on an hour are, are capable of understanding, understanding it in any, any language. language. He set to work to learn Iotic. He worked alone in room 46 because of Sabo's warning and because it came only too natural to him to work alone. Since he was very young, he had known that in certain ways he was unlike anyone else he knew. For a child, the consciousness of such difference is very painful since having done nothing yet and being capable of doing anything. Sorry, that's not in our book. Yeah. 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 Yeah, page 104 starts differently. Yeah. Oh, I think maybe you skipped a page. I skipped. It's <laughs> 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 okay for, the, for my purposes because I can just do it. My apologies. <laughs> <laughs> I, I jumped ahead. 
<laughs> your look was a total pet. <laughs> <laughs> we were looking at each other. Like, oh my God. <laughs> Page 104, like most people should have. <laughs> How can I learn Iotic? Grammar and a dictionary. Everybody's okay now? Yeah. <laughs> my apologies. Shevik stood his ground. Where do I find them? Here, Sabul growled. He rummaged among the untidy shelves of small green bound books. His movements were brusque and irritable. He located two thick unbound volumes on a bottom shelf and slapped them down on the desk. Tell me when you're competent to read Atro in Iotic. Nothing I can do with you till then. What kind of mathematics are these you're asked to use? Nothing you can't handle. Is anybody working here in chronotopology? Yes, Tourette. You can, you can consult him. You don't need his lecture course. I plan to attend Varab's lectures. What for? Her work in frequency and cycle. Sabul sat down and got up again. He was unbearably restless, rigid, restless yet rigid, a wood rasp of a man. Don't waste time. You're far beyond the old woman in sequency theory and the yeah, other ideas she's so trash. trash. I'm, I'm interested, interested in simultaneity in principles. Simultaneity? What kind what of profiteering crap is Midas feeding you up there? The physicist glared, the, the veins on his temples bulging under the coarse, coarse short, short hair. I organized a joint work course on in, in it myself. Grow up, grow up, grow up. Grow up. Time, time to grow, grow up. up. You're, You're here, here now. now. We're, We're working, working on physics here, not religion. religion. Drop, Drop the, the mysticism, mysticism and grow up. How, How soon can you learn Iotic? It took me several years. years. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> mysticism, religion, Shevik's physics? It took me several years to learn Prabhat, Shevik said. His mild irony passed several by completely. I did it in ten decades, well enough to read Toe's introduction. Oh, hell, you need a text to work on. Might as well be that. Here, wait. He hunted through an overflowing drawer and finally achieved a book, a queer-looking book, bound in blue, without the circle of life on the cover. Maybe if you read a little slower, is it hard to catch up? Oh, I was reading as fast as he was. So <laughs> I sped up to go with him. He was I just have, like, words circled, so we have to, like, get the right words. It's pretty okay. Stating the, the sentence, sentence as if it were a proposition, a proposition in logic. If you found a pack of explosive caps in the street, would you share them with every kid that went by? These, These books, books are, are explosives. explosives. Now do you follow me? Yes. All right. All right. Sabo, Sabo turned, turned away, away scowling, scowling with what appeared to be an endemic, endemic not, not a specific rage. Shevet left, left, carrying, carrying the, dynamite the dynamite carefully, carefully with, with revulsion and devouring, devouring curiosity. curiosity. He set to work to learn Iotic. He worked alone in room 46, because of Sabo's warning, and because it came only too naturally to him to work alone. Sensation, buffered by all the daily causal contacts and exchanges of communal life, and by the companionship of a few friends. Here in Abane, he had no friends, and because he was not thrown into the dormitory situation, he made none. He was too conscious at 20, and the peculiarities of his mind and character to be outgoing. He was withdrawn and aloof. His fellow students, sensing that the aloofness was real, did not try to approach him. The privacy of his room soon became dear to him. He savored his total independence. He left the room only for breakfast and dinner at the refectory and quick daily hike through the city streets to appease his muscles which he had always been used to exercise. was no beginner's handbook. By the time he had worked his way to the middle of the book, Shevik was no longer reading Iotic. He was reading physics, and he understood why Sabu had had him read the Erasti physicists before he did anything else. They were far ahead of anything that had been done by Moneros for 20 or 30 years. The most, the most brilliant, brilliant insights of Sabu's own work of sequencing were in fact translations from the Iotic unacknowledged. He plunged on through the other works Sabo doled out to him, the major works of contemporary Erasti physics. His life grew even more hermetic. He was not active in the student syndicate and did not attend the meetings of any other syndicate or federatives except the lethargic physics federation. The meetings of such groups, the vehicles of both social actions and, social, and sociability, were the framework of life in any small community who were in the city they seemed much less important. One was not necessary to them, 
there were always others ready to run things and doing it well enough. Except for tenth day duties and the usual janitorial assignments in his domicile and the laboratories, Shevik's time it was entirely on his own. Omitted exercise and occasionally meals. However, he never missed the one course he was attending. Kvarov's lecture group on frequency and cycle. Kvarov was old enough that she often wondered or maundered. Attendance at her lectures was small and uneven. She soon, she soon picked out the thin boy with big ears as her one constant auditor. She began to lecture for him. The light, steady, intelligent eyes met hers, steadied her, woke her. She flashed to brilliance, regained the vision lost. She soared, and the other students in the room looked up confused or startled, even scared if they had the wits to be scared. Kvarov saw a much larger universe than most people were capable of seeing, and it made them blink. The light-eyed boy watched her steadily. In his face, he saw her joy, what she offered, what she had offered for a whole lifetime, what no one had ever shared with her. He took, he shared. He was her brother across the goal of 50 years and her redemption. Vara being a student. When they met in the physics offices or the refectory, sometimes they fell straight to talking physics, but other times Kavarov's energy was insufficient for that, and then they found little to say, for the old woman was as shy as the young man. You don't eat enough, she would tell him. He would smile, and his ears would get red. Neither knew what else to say. After he had been at a half year at the Institute, Shevik gave Savo a three-page thesis entitled, a critique of Astro's infinite sequency hypothesis. Sabul returned it to him after a decade, growling, translated into iotic. I wrote it mostly in iotic to start with, Shevik said. Since I was using Astro's terminology, I'll copy out the original. What for? What for? So the dab profiteer Astro can read it. There's a ship in on the fifth of next decade. A ship? A freighter from Uras. Thus Shevik discovered that not only petroleum and mercury went back and forth between the sundered worlds, and not only books, such as the books he had been reading, but also letters. Letters. Letters to proletarians, to subjects of governments founded on the liquidity of power, to individuals who were inevitably exploited by and exploiters of others because they had consented to the elements in the state of Shishin. Did such people actually exchange ideas? Ideas about exchange. With free people in a non-aggressive, voluntary manner, could they really admit equality and participate in intellectual solidarity? Or were they merely trying to dominate, to assert their power, to possess? The idea of actually exchanging letters with a proprietarian alarmed him, but it would be interesting to find out. So many such discoveries had been forced on him during his first half year in Avenay that he had to realize that he had been, and possibly still was, very naive. Not an admission, not an easy admission for an intelligent young man to make. The first, and still the least acceptable of these discoveries was that he was supposed to learn iotic, but keep his knowledge to himself. A situation, situation so new to him and morally so, so confusing that he had not yet worked it out. out. Evidently, he did not exactly harm anybody by not sharing his knowledge with them. On the, the other, other hand, hand what conceivable harm could it do to them to know that, that he knew I it and that they could learn it too? Surely freedom lay rather in openness than in secrecy, and, and freedom, freedom is always worth, worth the risk. risk. He could not they're trying to keep perfection out. He could not see what the risk was anyway. It occurred to him once that Savile wanted to keep the new arrest of physics private, to own it as a property, a source of power over his body on our eyes. But his, this idea was so counter to Shevik's habits of thinking that it had great difficulty in getting itself clear in his mind. And when it did, he suppressed it at once with contempt as a genuinely disgusting thought. Privacy. Then there was the private room, another moral form, 
as, as a child, child if you slept alone, alone and single, single and met you and your father the others in your dormitory until they wouldn't tolerate you, you had, had egoized, solitude equated with disgrace. In, in adult terms, the principle of for a single, single room was a sexual one. Every domicile had a number of singles, and a couple that wanted to copulate used one of these free singles for a night, or a decade, or as long as they liked. A couple, a couple undertaking taking partnership, partnership took, took a double, double room. room. Privacy conflict. I got some little on physics. In a small town there was a, where there was no double available, they often built one, to, one onto the end of a domicile, and long, low, straggling buildings might thus be created room by room, called, called partners, partners, truck trains. Aside from sexual pairing, there, there was, there was no reason for not sleeping in a dormitory. dormitory. You, could you could choose a small one or a large one, one. and if you didn't like your roommates, your roommates you could move to another dormitory. dormitory. Everybody had the workshop, laboratory, studio, bar, or office that he needed for his work. One could be as private or as public as one chose in the baths. Sexual privacy was freely available and socially expected. And beyond that privacy was not functional. It was excess waste. The economy of Anaris would not support the building, maintenance, heating, lighting of individual housing and apartments. A person whose nature was genuinely unsociable had to get away from society and look after himself. He was completely free to do so. He could build himself a house wherever he liked. He could build himself, although it spoiled a good view or a fertile bit of land, he might find himself under heavy pressure from his neighbors to move elsewhere. There were good many solitaries and hermits on the fringes of the older Anarasti communities pretending they were not members of a social species. But for those who accepted the privilege and obligation of human solidarity, privacy was a value only where it served a function. Jack's first reaction to being put in a private room then was half disapproval and half shame. Why had they stuck him in there? He soon found out why. It was the right kind of place for his kind of work. If ideas arrived at midnight, he could turn on the light and write them down. If they came at dawn, they weren't jostled out of his head by the conversation and commotion of four or five rooms getting out. If they didn't come at all, and he had to spend his whole day sitting at his desk, staring out the window, there was nobody behind his back to wonder why he was slacking. Privacy, in fact, was almost as desirable for physics as it was for sex, but all the same, was it necessary? There was always a dessert at the Institute Refectory at dinner. Shevik enjoyed it very much. And then there were extras, he took them. And his conscience, his organic societal conscience, got indigestion. Didn't everybody at every refectory, from Abane to Uttermost, get the same, share and share alike? He had always been told so, and he had always found so. Of course there were local variations, regional specialties, shortages, surpluses, makeshifts in situations such as project camps, poor cooks, good cooks, in, in fact, fact an endless variety within, within the unchanging framework. But no cook was so talented that he could make a dessert without the makings. Most refectories served dessert once or twice a decade. There it was served nightly. Why? Were, were the, the members, members of the Central, Central Institute of the Sciences better than other people? France, France or Europe? Stratification. Shevik. Shevik did not ask these questions of anyone else. The social the conscience, the opinion of others, was the most powerful moral force motivating the behavior of most, most at RST. But, but it was all less powerful, powerful in him than, than, than most of them. Sharing the still has a form of ownership. A collective one has to look private, but it's still ownership that the, that the avant transmitted. So many reasons out conflict. So many of his problems. The, the phasing model, model was simply, simply too big to be useful. useful. His throat felt, felt sore. He, he wished, wished there was a letter from someone he knew. knew. Or maybe, maybe somebody in the physics office, office to say hello to, at least. But, but nobody, nobody was there, there except Savon. 
Look here, Shevik. He looked at the book the older man held out. A thin book, bound in green, the circle of life on the cover. He took it and looked at the title page. A critique of Atro's infinite sequency, sequency hypothesis. It was his essay, Atro's acknowledgement and defense, and his reply. It had all been translated or retranslated into Pravic and printed by the PDC presses in Abane. There were two authors' names, Sabo Shevik. Sabo pinned his neck over the copy Shevik held and glowed it. His growl became throaty and chuckling. We finished Ashra, finished him, the damn profiteer. Now let them try to talk about puerile imprecision. Sabo had nursed 10 years resentment against the physics review of IUEU University which have referred to his theoretical work as crippled by provincialism and the puerile imprecision with which Adonian dogma infects every area of thought. They'll see who's provincial now, he said, grinning. In nearly a year's acquaintance, Shevik could not recall having seen him smile. Shevik sat down across the room, clearing a pile of papers off a bench to do so. The physics office was, of course, communal. But Sabo kept his back room of the two, littered with materials he was using, so that there never seemed to be quite room for anyone else. Shevik looked down at the book he still held. Then out the window, he felt and looked rather ill. He also looked tense, but with Sabo, he never had been shy or awkward, as he often was with people whom he had liked, who he would have liked to know. I, don't, I didn't know you were translating it, he said. Translated, translated it, it, edited it. it. Polished some, some of the rough spots, spots, filled in transitions, transitions you've left out, and so forth. A couple, couple of deckheads work. You, you should be proud of it. Your ideas, ideas to a large extent form the groundwork of the finished book. book. It consisted Consistently entirely of Shevik's and Nacho's ideas. ideas. Yes, yes Shevik said. He looked, he looked down at his hands. hands. Presently he said, I'd like, I'd like to publish the paper I wrote this quarter on reversibility. It ought to go to Atra. It, it would interest, interest him. He still, still hung up on causation. Publish it? Where? Where? In my attic, I meant. On your yours. Send, send it to Atra, like, like this last one, and he'll put it in one of the journals there. <coughs> you can't give them a work to publish that hasn't been printed here. But what we do with this one, all this, except my rebuttal, came out in the IU Ian review before this came out here. I couldn't have read that. Why do you think I hurried this? I don't think everybody at PDC approves of our trading ideas with your ass like this, do you? Defense insists that every word that leaves here on those traders be passed by a PDC-approved expert. And on top of that, do you think all the provincial physicists who don't get it get in on this pipeline to earn it, or else don't begrudge are using it? Think they aren't envious? There are people lying in wait, lying in wait for us to make a false step. If you were ever caught doing it, We'll lose, if we're ever caught doing it, we'll lose that mail slot on the university freighters. You see the picture now? How did the Institute get that mail slot in the first place? Piper's election to the PDC 10 years ago. Piper had been a physicist of moderate distinction. I've trod down carefully to keep it ever since. See? Shevik nodded. In any case, Asha doesn't want to read that stuff of yours. I looked that proper over, that, that, that excuse me, I looked that paper over I gave it back to you decades ago. When are you going to stop, stop wasting, wasting time on these reactionary theories? Theories of Grara, it claims to. Can't, can't you see she's wasting her, her whole life, life on them? If you keep at it, you're, you're going to make a fool of yourself. Which, of course, is your inalienable right. You're not going to make a fool of me. What if I submit the paper for publication here, in private sense? Waste of time. <coughs> Travick absorbed this with a slight nod. He got out. Blanky and angular. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, and stood a moment, <coughs> amongst his thoughts. The winter light lay harsh on his hair, which he now wore pulled back in a queue, and his, and his still face. He came to the desk and took a copy off the little stock of new books. I'd like to send one of those to Mittis, he said. Take, Take all you want. want. Listen. Listen. If you, if you think, think you know, you know what, you're what you're doing, doing better than, than I, I do, then, then submit, submit that, that paper, paper to the press. press. You, don't you don't need, need permission. permission. This, this isn't some, some kind of hierarchy, hierarchy you, know. you know. 
I can't, I can't stop, stop you. you. All I can, All I can do is give you my advice. advice. Sometimes it's safe. You're the press syndicate's, press syndicate's consultant, consultant on manuscripts, on manuscripts and, and physics, shall we I say. Thought I'd say. I thought I'd save time for everyone by asking you now. His, His gentleness, gentleness was uncompromising, uncompromising because, because he would not compete for dominance. dominance. He, he was, was indomitable. indomitable. Save time, what do you mean? Savile growled, but Savile was also an Andonian. He writhed if physically tormented by his own hip hypocrisy, turned away from Shevik, turned back to him, and said spitefully, his voice thick with anger, go ahead, submit the damn thing. I'll declare myself incompetent to give counsel on it. I'll tell them to consult Kvara. She's the simultaneous expert, not I. The mystical, mystical Gagaeus. The universe as a giant harp string, oscillating in and out of existence. What note does it play, by the way? What to do is get the job done, Shevik pleaded in his mind, as he walked across the, the mall towards the Domasol Quadrangle in the gray, windy afternoon. It's my duty. It's my joy. It's the purpose of my whole life. The man I have to work with is competitive, a dominant seeker, a profiteer, but I can't change that. If I want to work, I have to work with him. He thought about Mittis and her warning. He thought about the North Setting Institute and the party the night before he left. It seemed very long ago now, and so childishly peaceful and secure that he could have wept in nostalgia. As he passed under the porch of the Life Sciences Building, a girl passed looking sidelong at him, and he thought that she looked like that girl. What was her name? The one with short hair, who'd eaten so many fried cakes the night of the party. He stopped and turned, but the girl was gone round the corner. Anyway, anyhow, she had had long hair. Gone, gone, everything gone. He came out from the shelter of the porch into the wind. It was a fine rain on the wind, sparse. Rain, rain was sparse, sparse when it fell at all. This was a dry world. Dry, pale, inimical, inimical, Shevik said out loud and ionic. He'd never heard the language spoken. It sounded very strange. The rain stung his face like thrown gravel. It was an inimical rain. His sore throat had been joined by a terrific headache, of which he had only just become aware. <coughs> he got to room 46 and lay down on the bed platform, which seemed to be so much further down than usual. He shook. He could not stop shaking. He pulled the orange blanket up around him and huddled up, trying to sleep, sleep. But he could, he could not, not stop shaking, shaking because he was under constant, constant atomic bombardment from all sides, increasing as, as the temperature increased. He had never been ill, and never any physical discomfort worse than tiredness. Having no idea what a high fever was like, he thought during the lucid intervals of that long night that he was going insane. Fear of madness drove him to seek help when the day came. He was too frightened of himself to ask help from his neighbors on the corridor. He heard himself raving in the night. He dragged himself to the local clinic, eight blocks away. The cold streets bright, with sunrise spinning solemnly around him. At the clinic, they diagnosed his insanity as a light pneumonia and, and, and told him to go to bed in Ward 2. He protested. The aide accused him of egoizing. Explained that he went home, the physician would have to go to the trouble of calling on him there and arranging private care for him. He went to bed in Ward 2. All the other people in the room were old. An aide came and offered him a glass of water and a pill. What is it? Shemek asked suspiciously. His teeth were chattering again. Antipyretic. What's that? <coughs> Bring down the fever. I don't need it. The aide shrugged. All right, she said, and went on. Most young, young and arresting felt that it was shameful to be ill, a result of their society's very successful prophylaxis, and also perhaps of the confusion arising from the, from the analogic use of the words healthy and, and sick. They felt illness to be a crime, if an involuntary one, to yield to the criminal impulse, to pander to it by taking pain relievers, was immoral. They fought shy of pills and shots. As middle age and old age came on, most of them changed their view. The pain got worse than the shame. The aide gave the old men in war to their medicine, and they joked with her. Shevik watched with full incomprehension. Later on, there was a doctor with an injection needle. I don't want it, Shevik said. Stop egoizing, the doctor said. Roll over, Shevik obeyed. So far, Moth.
making someone stop. Later on, there was a woman who held a cup of water for him, but he shook so much that the water was spilled, wetting the blanket. Let me alone, he said. Who are you, she told him. But he, she told him, but he did not understand. He told her to go away. He felt very well. Then he explained to her why the cyclic hypothesis, though unproductive in itself, was, was essential, essential to his approach to a possible, a possible theory of simultaneity, a cornerstone. He spoke partly in his own language and partly in Ionic, and wrote the formulas and equations on a slate with a piece of chalk so that she and the rest of the group would understand, as he was afraid they would misunderstand about the cornerstone. She touched his face and tied his hair back for him. Her hands were cool. He'd never, he never felt, felt anything, anything pleasanter in all his life than the touch of her hands. He had reached out for her hand. She was not there. She had gone. A long time later, he was awake. He could breathe. He was perfectly well. Everything was all right. He felt disinclined to move. To move would disturb the perfect, stable moment, the balance of the world. The winter light along the ceiling was beautiful beyond expression. He lay and watched it. The old men down the ward were laughing together. Old, husky, cackling laughs. A beautiful sound. The woman came in and sat down by his cot. He looked at her and smiled. How do you feel? Newborn. Who are you? She also smiled. The mother. Rebirth. Rebirth. But I'm supposed to get a new body, not the same old one. What on earth are you talking about? Nothing on earth. On Uris, rebirth is part of their religion. You're still lightheaded. She touched his forehead. No fever. Her voice in saying these two words touched and struck something very deep in Shevik's being. A dark place, a place walled in, where it reverberated back and back in the darkness. He looked at the woman and said with terror, You, you are ruler. I told you I was, several times. She, she maintained an expression, expression of unconcern, even, even of humor. humor. There was no there was question of no Shevik's maintaining, maintaining anything. He had, he had no, no strength, strength to move, move but, but he shrank away, away from her in unconcealed fear as if she were not, not his mother, mother but, his, but death. his death. In fact, you look like me, except in coloring. I thought you'd look like Palat. I assumed it. It's strange how one's imagination makes these assumptions. He stayed with you then. Shevik nodded. He was lucky. She did not sigh, but a suppressed sigh was in her voice. So was I. There was a pause. She smiled faintly. Yes, I could have kept in touch with you, but you hold it against me. Why not have I done so? Hold it against you? I never knew you. You did. Halad and I kept you with us in the domicile, even after you were weaned. We both wanted to. Those first years are when the individual contact is essential. The psychologists have proved it conclusively. Full socialization can be developed only from that affection beginning. I was willing to continue the partnership. I tried to have Palat posted here to Abenay. There never was an opening in his line of work, and he wouldn't come without a posting. He had a stubborn streak. At first he wrote sometimes to tell me how you were. Then he stopped writing. It doesn't matter, the young man said. His face thin from illness. He was covered with very fine drops of sweat, making his cheeks and forehead look silvery, as if oiled. There was a silence again, and Rulek said in her controlled, pleasant voice, well, yes, it mattered and it still matters. But Palat was the one to stay with you and see you through your integrated years. He was supportive. He was parental, as I am not. The work comes first with me. me. It has always come first. Still, I'm glad you're here now, Shabek. Perhaps I can be of some use to you now. I know Abenay is a forbidding place at first. One feels lost, isolated, lacking the simple solidarity. The little towns might have. The little towns have. I know interesting people whom you might like to meet. The old men down at, at the end of the war were admiring her, nudging each other. I suppose, she said, that I was trying to make a claim on you, but I thought in terms of your making a claim on me, if you wanted to. He said nothing. We aren't except biologically mother and son, so, of, course. of course. She had regained her faint smile. You don't, don't remember, remember me. me. And, and the baby, baby I remember is isn't this man of 20. 20. All, All that, that time, time is past, irrelevant. But we, we are, are brother and sister, sister here and now. 
which is what really matters, isn't it? I don't know. She sat without speaking for a minute, then stood up. You need to rest. You were quite ill the first time I came. They say you'll be quite all right now. I don't suppose I'll be back. He did not speak. She said, goodbye, Shannon, and turned from him as she spoke. She had either a glimpse or a nightmare imagination of her face, changing drastically as they spoke, breaking down, going all to pieces. It must have been imagination. She walked out of the ward with the graceful measured gait of a handsome woman, and he saw her stop and speak, smiling to the aide out in the hall. He gave way to the fear that he had come with her, the sense of the breaking of promises, the, inc the incoherence of time. He broke. He began to cry trying to hide his face in the shelter of his arms, for he could not find the strength to turn over. One of the old men, the sick old man, came and sat on the side of the cot and patted his shoulder. It's all right, brother. It'll be all right, little brother, he muttered. Shepard heard him and felt his touch, but no one took no comfort in it. Even from the brother, there is no comfort in the bad hour, in the dark, at the foot of the wall.